Oh, we're back. Hello, Engineering fam, and welcome to another episode of Elevated. I'm your host, The Elevated Engineer. So, before we get into it, I want us to start a, a little video uh, really quick. Just give me a moment while I set it up. All right, we can see it now. We can we can see it. Okay, this is it. All right, so here we are. Let's watch this video. In what ways have blacks been given good stations? We need the black community to realize that the, that black people are hurting Asians and. They need to speak out of, uh, in their own community. Our communities are not reporting these incidences. We don't want to cause more trouble, more attention to our community. It strikes me that this is the Asian equivalent of the talk that African-American parents often have to have with their children. In what ways have Blacks been pitted against Asians? We need the Black community to realize that... Okay. You all realize what the hell I'm talking about, right? All right, so I find this video interesting. Um, I really do. Not only do they imply Asians receive tremendous amounts of racism as compared to other groups, but what's really interesting is that they, without saying directly, are implying that it's black folks committing these racist acts, which is, in my opinion, ridiculous. And here's why gathering at a South Los Angeles park, remembering the teen whose life was cut short. Craving an adventure binge? Sorry, I had to, I had to go rewind it. it Gotta have to watch this ad again. The worst, because I muted it and you didn't get to hear it the from the beginning. So, yeah. LA, a somber ceremony yesterday to remember a young black teenager fatally shot by a Korean-born store owner in 1991. Many say Latasha Harlan's murder contributed to the 1992 Los Angeles riots. Eyewitness News reporter Amy Powell tells us emotions are still running high decades later. We just humble that you took your time and your dedication. A mural honoring the life of Latasha Harlan's on what would have been her 45th birthday. Family and friends gathering at a South Los Angeles park, remembering the teen whose life was cut short at the age of 15. And I sure appreciate that. And I look at it, I said, that's my granddaughter. And I miss her. I miss her. People don't know who she was as an individual. They don't know. The Netflix documentary, A Love Song for Latasha, looks at the life of the teenager who had big dreams for the future. She wanted to be a lawyer, so that's what she was aiming for, to get good grades. In 1991, Latasha Harlins was shot and killed in a South L.A. liquor store. The Korean store owner, Soon Ja Du, firing the fatal shots after accusing the teenager of stealing a $1.79 bottle of orange juice. Police concluded the teen was not shoplifting. Harlan's death helping fuel the 1992 riots in Los Angeles, her family fighting for justice for decades. We will leave and we will make sure that her name is not forgotten and the truth about Latasha Harlan. The director of the documentary says she didn't want to focus on the tragedy. I really wanted to see her live and exist in her fullness. I wanted to make sure her story wasn't forgotten. This community center was a home away from home for Latasha and her relatives when they were kids. To have her memorialized here in a mural means a lot to her family and the community. We queens, we can't think of ourselves low because the next person already think of us low. So we have to uplift each other. Amy Powell, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Yeah, so y'all remember the Latasha Harlins. Uh, this little girl was murdered by the Korean store clerk, uh, Soon Ja Do. Uh, so at the end of the day, what were her charges and what was her sentence? Do we know? Let's let's go ahead and see. I think her charges were probation or something, right? Hold on, just give me a second. Uh, Soon, what the hell is Ja Do? Soon Ja Do, uh, sentence. 
Ah. Newell was tried and convicted of voluntary manslaughter and Harlan's death. Although the jury recommended the sentence of 16 years, Judge Joyce Carlin sentenced due to time served. Five years of probation, 400 hours of community service, a 500 restitution, and funeral expenses. Okay. So, um... I... I, I <laughs> this is just, I, I, I really brought this up for, for a very important reason. Um, um, because it's, it's, it's bullshit. But just in case you're saying, okay, that was a long time ago. Uh, it's not the same. What about this one? Uh, this story. Peter Liang, you remember that? And what did Peter Liang get? How did the Asian and Chinese community respond to Peter Liang's situation? Uh, here's the story was more or less uh, Peter Liang was in the hood. He seen a guy. He said the guy was trying to kill him. He was in the he was in a project. He was where he shouldn't have been, and he he, he killed the guy. He murdered a guy because he said, it's a typical police story, he said he had a gun, and blah, blah, blah. And they charged him, they convicted him guilty of that crap. But look, what was the, what was the, what was the Asian and Chinese American response to Peter Liang, right? I remember it very vividly. They were protesting. Now, to be fair, there were, there were a couple of other, there, no, I won't say a couple, there's a few other Asians on the other side protesting but not really nearly close to the ones on the other side for peter liang um so you all tell me <laughs> you all tell me where's the racism really coming from okay um we all kind of know right so just look at the headline Exactly. So, show me the equivalent proof of blacks targeting any groups in America ever. <laughs> As the video stated, the LA 1992 riots were in response to the blatant anti-black racism. Much of that racism, of course, came from Asian nail salons, Asian-owned beauty shops, and Asian-owned businesses. I'm speaking from experience. Everybody in the hood knows which stores treat mostly black customers like garbage. <laughs> we know. I can't tell you how many times I've been treated like a criminal when I go into an Asian-owned business. Uh, black folks aren't racist or hateful people. But if you treat us like trash in a country we built, then we go see you. It's really as simple as that. Fuck that. I won't even get into all the videos of grown Asian men beating the brakes off of sisters inside stores and restaurants. But you know what really bothers, I would say, black folks the most? Like, what really, like, gets... I, I, okay, black folks, but me, really. What really gets... Irritates me about this whole situation. Um, let me close that really quick. I've spoken on this channel in detail... About my love for, I mean, Asian culture. I've talked about anime, how I'm a super anime head. I've even gotten into the details of anime. Why a why manga is better than American comic books. I study martial arts profusely. Um, even though martial arts is from everywhere, the type of martial arts, jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu, um, I mean, I'm wearing a damn gi in a belt, which is, I mean, it's kind of Asian, um, uh, uh culture <laughs> to, to be honest, a gi in a belt ranking system is, is Asian culture, Japanese culture, uh, but Asian nonetheless, um, I've lived in Jap uh, Japan. Watashi wa Nihango Hanosu. Bakaro. Uh, I, 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 I mean, come on, bro. I've studied, I've studied Japanese languages, culture um, in college, and I lived over there. So, And I do Japanese martial arts, and I am a huge anime fan. And I love, you know, Chinese martial arts. I love, I, 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 I love this stuff. 
Um, black folks have embraced pretty much everyone. Um, if we if we if we if we fuck with you, we fuck with you. How many times has Wu Tang Clan done that whole karate, whatever shit, right? How many Asian businesses are in black neighborhoods? So, I mean, that really, with this anti-black rhetoric that the mainstream media and, of course, Democrats are pushing, um, I got to ask any of the Asians who watch my show, any of my Asian friends, like, do y'all want it? Like, I'm serious, because there are many Asian businesses to this day that still have a large black customer base. So my question is, do y'all want that Martin Luther King smoke? Do y'all want crowds of black folks and really other folks, but really black folks boycotting and protesting your businesses every day for the foreseeable future? Because I got to be honest, if I don't see more ages coming out and speaking against this kind of anti-black propaganda bullshit, then we will have a boycott Asian business sort of year. Black folks can shut down the entire nation if we wanted to. Don't believe me? Try us. Because this is bullshit. We ain't got no hate for, for any agents, man. Come on now. Be serious. Black folks. So the people. Let me get this straight. Because this is the rhetoric that they're trying to push. Uh, so the people. Black folks. Who are at the bottom of every list of good things in this country. And we are at the top of every bad thing in this country as a whole. We are the poorest. We have the least amount of wealth. We have the 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 highest uh, in childbirth rate, uh, death rate, I should say. Uh, we have the highest rate of cancer, highest rate of diabetes. Black men make up nearly fifty percent of the entire prison population. Yet we only make up around six and a half percent of the entire U.S. population. Uh, the amount of wealth in, in, in black homes is ridiculous. I'm willing to bet that Asians as a whole, who have a significantly smaller population than black folks in America, likely own more wealth than all black folk com combined in this country. So let's, 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 let's not get this twisted, man. Let's not get it confused. Um... This is bullshit. So, like I said, if I don't if I don't see more more Asian people speaking out against this type of shit and co-signing this stuff, all right, cool. All right, black people racist. We 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 targeting Asian people. We 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 are the most vulnerable population in America. Yet we somehow find find time to to target Asian people, Asian folks, and on some racist bullshit. Why? Because black folks don't have enough problems going on in this country right now are you serious okay try us next topic i have another video i want you all to watch richard Feynman was one of the first to suggest that quantum mechanics can be harnessed to make a new type of computer almost 40 years later and we are finally seeing the emergence of these types of machines a traditional computer uses bits which either encode as zero or one Whereas a quantum computer uses qubits, which can be in the superposition of 0 or 1 at the same time, until observed. This would theoretically allow a quantum computer to process a vast number of calculations simultaneously. These qubits can be made... Now, before, I, before we really get into it, guys, like, share, and subscribe. I really appreciate it. Leave a comment. Also, I know my, my engineering fam is super fan is uh, super smart and understands quantum physics to every single bit or qubit, I should say. Uh, but this is just a refresher and an update. So just rock and roll with me. Eight of atoms, molecules, or even photons. But qubits are tricky to manipulate since any instability would cause them to fall outside of their quantum state. This is a really tough problem because you need to tell the qubit a command while isolating them from outside interference. So as of right now, we are trying to figure out how to maintain qubit stability with proper error correcting. But it is important to keep in mind that quantum computers are not really meant to replace conventional computers. There are different types of computing problems, and these vary in complexity. These three subsets include problems which classical computers can solve in linear time, 
Then there's NP, in which solutions are easy to verify, but tricky to implement. And then finally we have NP hard problems, which are difficult to solve, and no known algorithm has yet to solve this efficiently. Now, quantum computers theoretically can solve P and some NP problems, but it's going to take a very innovative quantum algorithm. In simple terms, quantum computers may be able to do extensive chemistry, particle research, and predictive modeling such as weather forecasting. But we are looking at thousands, maybe even millions of qubits with error correction to get to this type of everyday application. And thousands. <clears throat> Now remember the last last quantum update I said I believe uh, a Chinese company said that they had just over 50 qubits. <laughs> so, we need to get to the point where we can stabilize at least a thousand qubits for it to be practical and viable for everyday use. And that is a little bit of a ways away. Let's just hope it's not going to take another 30 years like Fusion Power. And keep, it, keep in mind, it took us about maybe uh, 80 years to get to this point. <laughs> so, yeah, pay attention. Power. Regardless, we are seeing some pretty unique noisy qubit computers which are coming out right now. And they are the first steps towards something practical. Now, most of these machines are using atoms for qubits, and typically their performance is measured by quantum volume. IBM, Intel, Google, Honeywell, and several other companies are racing towards reaching several thousand quantum volumes. So it will be very interesting to see how this will pan out. Now, the biggest challenge for these types of computers is that they need to have their qubits cooled down to near absolute zero. So it's not something that's going to sit on your desk anytime soon. Their purpose is more towards improving processing connections between qubits and lowering error rates for quantum computing. So you can kind of think of these machines as first generation quantum computers. And they are paving the way for more advanced designs. Now this kind of leads us into a different approach for qubit composition. Photonic computing may be able to solve the cryogenic problem and this would involve circuits and optical crystals to manipulate light, maybe at room temperature. So a lot of companies are already focusing on how to manipulate photonic qubits. But one recent notable development involves joint quantum and their single photonic transistor. They claim that one million of these transistors could fit inside a couple of millimeters and process 10 billion photonic qubits every second. The photonic chip has numerous holes, and this basically traps light. But more specifically, quantum dots store information about the photons and their interactions. Theoretically, this is completely scalable, and it does bypass the cryogenic requirements of older quantum computers. So it will be very interesting to see if this emerges past the research phase. But another neat thing about photonic processing is that it can integrate with fiber optic communications and create very powerful networks, maybe possibly quantum internet, but we will cover that in another video. Now another interesting development... Actually, the quantum internet for me presents a, oh my god, unlimited amount of possibilities. The reason is, and actually, um, I didn't do a presentation on this, but um, last semester a guy did a really good presentation on a quantum internet in my quantum my quantum computing course why why it interests someone like me or really anybody is we're talking about an internet that can be possibly be decentralized and you can really if if everything you know if it works out how i think it'll work out you can really take the hands of the internet out of a few different companies like AT&T, Comcast, all these, these, these humongous telecommunication companies that we hate. And if it's done right, we could have a internet managed, um, built, used, and really controlled by everyone. <laughs> See, that's everyone that is clutch that's called human progress because where we at right now 
uh, the internet, and especially in America, the internet in, in America, it sucks. It's bad. It's horrible. It's slow. It's it's. Oh my God! If you if you, if people travel outside the U.S., go to places like Japan or uh, 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 Korea or or uh, like uh, Germany or um. The internet is blows ours away. I didn't even know that it's illegal. I'm going on a little bit of rant, but I didn't even know that it's illegal uh, in many of these countries for um, uh, for telecommunication companies to throttle your internet, i.e., uh, slowing your internet down when there's a lot of traffic or whatever, or when they just want to your data plan or whatever. So the quantum internet is. What interests me the most, also um, the cybersecurity elements and the data processing elements of quantum computing, meaning processing large, large, large swaths of data. And it's the Jui Zing project in China. And this processor utilizes optical circuits for calculations. The chip basically detects photons, and they claim that it can calculate 10 billion. Oh, that's it. That's it. Uh, the I hope I'm saying this, but Ju Zhang quantum processor. I think they're the ones in China who uh, claim that they achieved quantum supremacy a little while ago. Ten times faster than Google's current quantum computer. However, we have to keep in mind that there is no confirmation on this, and it's years away from tackling everyday computational problems. Anyways, another really important development. Also, there's no confirmation that China actually has obtained quantum supremacy. We're only going off what their word says. I did a, I did a show about this before as well. Is Xanadu's photonic quantum computer. It's also the first commercially available cloud platform of its kind. So they have a 1224 qubit processors which can run at room temperature. And this approach will work towards a universal fault-tolerant quantum computing system which networks multiple processors together. The chips are made from silicon nitrate, and they include squeezers, which are the inputs, gates, and photon detectors, which are the outputs. So this is known as continuous variable quantum computing, and it does not employ single photon generators. So it's basically using squeeze states consisting of superpositions of multiple photons. And this type of computer might actually be better for error correction and fault tolerance. Photonic chips can also be used for neuromorphic computing and create very advanced AI systems. Now, this is a different type of architecture which utilizes neural networks, and this is intended to basically mimic the human brain and its neurons. So, if you want to build the next humanoid robot from Ex Machina, then this is probably the hardware that you want to have. Okay, so why... Why is that important? I just, I wanted to, and I want you all to see me on this. Why is this important? Because this is what I really talk about. Like, this is, I've been talking about this for a couple of years. I've been on YouTube for less than a year, but I've been talking about this for a couple of years. The reason quantum computing is going to change the game is with AI. Because at the very, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. At the very, um, most basic processing level is machine code, right? So classical computers process information with zeros and ones. Zero for no, one for yes, right? That's how they process any information. So a, a lot of times people think, oh, smart computers. Computers aren't smart at all. They're just, they're literally the most basic, not even children level intelligence, right? It's literally zero or one, yes or no. Turn on. Yes. Turn off. No. Is a computer running? Yes. Is a computer uh, is a computer running at a high speed? Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. So at the very most basic machine level, zero one, a computer is not thinking. A classical computer is not thinking. But with quantum computing, it changes the game because at the most basic level, as stated earlier, a qubit, unlike a class a classical bit, can be either zero one or whatever it wants depending on really um uh a state whichever state it wants to be and it's observable state so basically when you look at it it becomes whatever so that's what makes class computing and quantum computing different because 
at its most basic core, qubits, when implemented, can make a decision. That's what is that's what separates quantum computing processing from classical computing processing. Quantum computers at their most basic level, AI and artificial intelligence can make decisions. Oh, <gasps> and it doesn't have to be either one or the other. It could be something in between, gray area. Because that's how humans think. Humans don't think of zeros and ones. We think in gray areas. We think of here's zero. Here's one, and human beings process in energy, energy, information by everything that happens in between the zero and one. So that's how quantum computers are different. At the most basic level, unlike classical computer, quantum computing and quantum computers can think. And that's what makes them different. Let's finish. Anyway, several groups are already working on the basic framework for neuromorphic processors. And one particular team has already developed a neuromorphic chip which conceptually works on hundreds of optical neurons. A neural network basically takes the sum of these artificial neurons, makes a decision based on these inputs, and then sends it to the next network. Once again, this is not something that is made for your typical desktop computer, and it's more specifically designed for AI applications. But it does exemplify that developing a photonic processor could create a very rapid revolution in computing. I've only briefly touched on some of the projects that are happening right now in relation to the quantum computing world. But as every year passes by, we are getting very close to something that can actually calculate something practical. And I think in 50 years, we are going to have computers which are very different from the ones we are using right now. So, once again, thanks for watching. Please like the video if you enjoyed it. And all right, all right. So, um, what is photonics, really? I mean, uh, simply put, photonics is light science, okay? So, this was a very technical video, I know. Um, and anyone, black folks or DOD, pay attention. As the video highlighted, making quantum computers practical is paramount. Uh, only in the coming decades is quantum computing becomes more, as quantum be co computing becomes more viable. So right now, that's kind of where we're at in the quantum computing space. Uh, we've come a long way from understanding physics, quantum physics in the last 80 years to Schrodinger's cat. So on to the next one, Web Scripper update. Uh, I'm going to be releasing that later in this week probably either monday or tuesday it goes over a good deal of things uh mechanical soup um it goes over uh real time updates okay so um no no i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm getting myself confused i'm getting myself confused i apologize the the that's the bot videos right that i'm, I'm talking about too but i'm i'm specifically Thinking on the web scraper videos, the bot videos is coming after. But the web scraper videos is going to be um, highlight uh, mining for data uh, through forms and databases. Uh, I'm going to be using the mechanical soup, like I mentioned earlier, uh, which is for that specific reason. And also, a really big thing. Because when, you, when you're going to be doing data scraping, data mining, all this stuff, uh, often your clients will have you run these programs to, to get this information maybe on a weekly or a, you know, a daily basis even. Uh, so a big thing that I want to focus on in this upcoming, the, the final uh, video in this web scraper series is actually real-time updates so like let's say you're mining twitter or something uh you obviously twitter updates all the time so you want to have your web scraper uh running um and getting the most current information that you are looking for so not necessarily, you know, all the information, but the information that's that's relevant to the job that you're doing. Uh, so, yeah, so that's really what we're going to be focusing on this next video. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's that's pretty much it. I don't think there. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One more thing. Uh, the bot video. The bots video. That's coming after. Uh, so the bots video. Um, I'm going to be using Python. It's basically I'm going to be building a bot to automatically uh, mine and retrieve data. So uh, this first one was a web scraper series. The next one is going to be the bot series. Uh, the little mini AI um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be implementing machine learning. I'll see. Uh, the data set, I'll probably be going through it. Varies in size. So, uh, anyways, regardless, um, that's it for today's episode of Elevated. Hope you all enjoyed it. It was informative. Uh, we got to start working and loving each other, man. <laughs> Uh, that, that goes across all spectrums. We got to start working with each other because a lot of stuff I'm seeing uh, on the Twitter. Uh, black people don't hate nobody. We, we really don't. We don't have time to. It's, all, it's already hard enough. So that be saying, that's this episode of Elevated. I'm your host, the Elevated Engineer. I appreciate it. That's it.